Heavenly Father, we are just one gathering amongst your churches throughout the world where your children, those who have been saved by grace, have gathered in places just like this to remember, to be encouraged by, and to strive to walk in the resurrection of your Son. I ask, Father, that you would be gracious with us this morning and that by the power of your Holy Spirit you would cause us to see not only the historical truth of your Son rising 2,000 years ago, but the power of that resurrection right now, that by grace through faith we too, once dead in our sins, can be risen even now and have hope of that glorious resurrection in the end when your Son comes to raise the living and the dead and establish his kingdom here on earth. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would do only that which you can do for those who know your Son this morning, that you would cause them to hear and to be encouraged. And for those who do not know the Son, I pray, Lord, that you would cause them to, that you would cause their hearts to be stirred this morning through your Word, that you would cause them to see that you are a good and gracious God, that you desire none to perish but all to be saved. Cause us this morning, Lord, to see the great work that you have done through Christ and are doing through your people. And give us that hope of that glorious resurrection of the dead on that last day. Let us fix our hope completely on the grace to be brought when Christ comes again in glory. And let us be ready for it, Father. I pray, Lord, that you would use this time here in this church and all your true churches here in the South Bay and indeed your churches throughout the world. I pray you would use this time for the gospel to go out and for many, many to be saved. Lord, if you'd be pleased to bring about a great revival in our time, Lord, um, how glorious that would be. We have many family members and friends and co-workers and neighbors who do not know Christ. And we know that he will come and we know that he will judge because he's a good judge. And so by your grace and mercy, use us to open our mouths and testify to the goodness of the gospel that others might hear repent, and believe too. Lord, take the proclaimed word this morning, apply it to our hearts and minds, and change us into the image of your Son, I pray. In his name, amen. Amen. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, Resurrection Sunday, it's just a good day. It's just a good day. Uh, it, the churches are full throughout the world today, so we are, you think of what's happening here, and that's being replicated throughout the world. Already started um, when Sunday started in the east, and it's making its way west. Um, there are millions of Americans, millions of Americans who have gathered in places of worship just like this to celebrate the, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. In fact, Lifeway, um, which is the publishing house for Southern Baptist Convention, they did a, a theology study, uh, a, a state of theology in our country back in 2020. And this is what they found. They found that two-thirds of Americans, that 66%, believe that Jesus Christ's physical resurrection, as described in the Bible, is completely accurate. 66% of Americans in 2020 believe that the description of the resurrection of Jesus Christ is completely accurate. They believe that the the Son of God came 2,000 years ago, born of the Virgin Mary, lived a sinless life. They believe he was arrested, tried, found guilty for crimes he did not commit, that he was handed over to Pontius Pilate, he was crucified, and he was buried. 66% of Americans polled believe that he actually went into the grave, and then on the third day, in fulfillment of the Scriptures, he rose from the dead bodily. And they believe that he testified to over 500 people over 40 days of this historical truth. Now, supermajority is hard to get anywhere. But these 66% who believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, they not only believe so because that's what the Bible teaches, they believe so because it's good history. In fact, if you want to believe in good history and you want to believe in truth, it's almost impossible to deny the resurrection of, the, of Jesus Christ. Thousands of years ago, hundreds of years before Christ came, we have all these prophecies that talk about Jesus coming and doing exactly what he did. 
We have eyewitnesses. We have disciples who saw him raised and then gave their life for the risen Savior. No one gives their life for a lie, but they did because it was true. We have all these testimonies and all these eyewitnesses, and we have all these historical records that by God's grace through the Spirit have been preserved for us, so we hold them in our hands today. We know the truth that Jesus Christ did in fact die and that he did in fact rise from the dead, and that's why you're here today, because you believe it, and by God's grace, you have embraced it. I would say believing in the resurrection is essential for anyone who's serious about history and anyone who's serious about truth. The 20th century New Testament historian and scholar, N.T. Wright, he wrote this, listen. He said, these three facts, the resurrection appearance, the empty tomb, and the origin of the Christian faith all point unavoidably to one conclusion, the bodily resurrection of Jesus from the dead. And then he said this, today, the rational man can hardly be blamed if he believes that on that first Easter morning, a divine miracle occurred. The rational man can hardly be blamed for believing what is good history and what we know to be true. In fact, it's so rational to believe that the God-man Jesus Christ came, lived, died, and rose, that to not believe it is bad history. It's bad history. What's not rational And what's not wise is to simply believe that this happened, but not respond to it. To say, yes, I believe that Christ actually rose from the dead, but there's no response to that resurrection. In other words, if Jesus did, in fact, rise and ascend into heaven, and he is seated right now on the throne, and he's Lord of lords, and he's King of kings, then we would have to argue his death and resurrection is unequivocally the most significant event in all of human history. I mean, nothing would come close to that. And to treat the truth of the resurrection as you would, let's say, the Roman Empire or World War II or even 9-11 for us, it would be the height of foolishness. If you accept the truth of the resurrection of Jesus but not the implications of his resurrection for you, for your loved ones, for human history, and for all eternity, then you can say lovingly to yourself, I am a fool. I'm a fool. This Resurrection Sunday... 2022, it's an amazing thought, isn't it? I want to look at a few verses from the Gospel of John. And these verses are early in Jesus' ministry. But he wants his disciples, and he wanted the Jews in the context of this passage to understand that, listen, his resurrection changes everything. It changes everything for everyone. It changes everything for all creation. If, in fact, he rose from the dead, then it changes everything. Far from being an isolated event 2,000 years ago, that you read about in either the Bible or a history text. His coming, his living, his dying, and his rising means you have hope. It means you have hope today. In all your sin, and all the struggles, you have hope of being raised today. And if you know Christ, it means that you have hope of being raised on that day when he comes again as the judge of the living and the dead. The resurrected king will return but when he returns, it will not be as he did the first time as a suffering servant. He will come as a king. So I want us to celebrate. I do. I want us to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ this Sunday by looking at John chapter 5, verses 25 to 29. And I want us to, I want us to grow in just two ways, two simple ways this morning. I would like the Holy Spirit to bless us with one, understanding the resurrection has come. The resurrection has come. You didn't miss it. Don't worry. And number two, the resurrection to come. The resurrection that has come and the resurrection to come. The theme of the sermon is this, listen. Hear the voice of Jesus now so you too can be raised to eternal life then. Hear the voice of Christ now, hear the voice of Christ today so that when he comes, you too will be raised to eternal life then. Amen, are you ready? All right. Number one, the resurrection has come. So in John chapter 5, it's really hard when you're outside of a, you know, we do book-by-book exegetical expository preaching. So it's hard. These one-offs are hard. So i got to put you in context here. John chapter 5, early in the ministry of Jesus, he's in Jerusalem. He's actually doing some healing. He's doing teaching on the kingdom. And he sees a man who's been paralyzed, lame, unable to walk for 38 years. And so what does Jesus do? Well, Jesus does what he does. He heals the man, right? He uses the power in the Holy Spirit, to make this man well. Well, you would think that everybody would rejoice over this. Not the case. He actually did this on the Sabbath day. And so the Jews in Jerusalem, they were very upset. So you don't do that kind of work on the Sabbath. 
They believed, according to their man-made laws, that any work, even acts of mercy done on the Sabbath, were considered hateful to God. This was Jesus' reply. Look at, take your eyes up to verse 17 in John 5. This was his response to them. He said, my father's working until now, even on the Sabbath day, and I am working. He said, well, that seems like a relatively harmless statement, but it was not. What he was saying is, the father and I are equal. The father and I are one. And the Jews picked up on this. Look at verse 18. This is why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. Because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, he wasn't. He was breaking their man-made laws on the Sabbath. But he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal to God. Now that would be the height of blasphemy if Christ is not God, but he is, therefore it's not. But rather than condemning him, these are people who want him dead. This is the Son of God. Rather than condemning him, rather than killing them on the spot, which he had the power to do, he loves them. He wants them saved. He wants them to know. And so what does he do? He elaborates on the gospel. He says, listen, the time has come, the resurrection has come for you in your sin to be raised spiritually from the dead right now. And he offers these enemies of him, his who want him dead, he offers them hope. Look at verse 25. He says, truly, truly, that's verily, verily. Amen, amen. Listen closely, Jesus says. Listen to what I'm about to say. He says, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God speaking of himself, and those who hear will live. And so he's talking about this, this day, this final day, this what we call the eschaton, or this eschatological future coming into the present. And he's, he brings it into their immediate moment. In other words, he's establishing for us this, in, in the kingdom of God, there's this already not yet tension. Right? When Jesus came, he ushered in the kingdom of God. He already started the process of reconciliation to God. So he set the kingdom in motion. So already, he said, something is happening powerful in your midst. We haven't hit the day yet, otherwise we wouldn't be here doing this. But he said, it's already started. The power of the resurrection, Jesus said, has already come to you, and you have access to it. Right? That's the great news of the gospel. The power has come, and you have access to it. And this resurrection power, it's described probably best with what a doctrine we call regeneration. You probably know the phrase, being born again. It's when the Holy Spirit comes and it makes a person who's spiritually dead, spiritually alive. And that's the resurrection that Christ is talking about to them. He said, it, the hour has come, it is here. In fact, Paul would later explain this really well in Ephesians chapter 2. He describes like this, Paul says, you were dead in your trespasses and your sins. And Paul describes all of mankind. He said, you are spiritually dead. That is the condition that we inherit from Adam and Eve, going all the way back to Genesis chapter 3 in the garden. And that is the state in which we live, exercising joyfully our sin and our rebellion against God. And if you know yourself well, you know that that is a true statement, that you had not lived your whole life loving God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And you certainly have not loved your neighbor as yourself all the time. Some of you say, I, I rarely do that. And what Jesus is saying here is that there's death that permeates the human condition. And we're talking spiritually dead. Not almost dead, not nearly dead, but profoundly put, dead, dead. Right? Completely dead. No spiritual life in you, no goodness, no righteousness, no relationship with God, no desire to be obedient to God. That is the state of fallen man. Now Christ comes in, and as Paul said in Ephesians 2, 4, he said, but God, being rich in mercy, did what? He made us alive together with Christ. And then he says in Ephesians 2, 6, and what? He raised us up with him. Some theologians call this the first resurrection. You're raised spiritually. You're dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh and Christ comes by the Spirit and you're born again and you're made alive. You're resurrected right now. And that's what he's talking about. He's saying there's real power right now for you sinful Jews and for us sinful men to be raised from our spiritual state of slavery from death to life from sin and rebellion to what to love and obedience to god it's such a glorious thought peter writes this first peter 1 3 he said according to his great mercy god has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of jesus christ from the dead so the resurrection of christ two thousand years ago ushered power into this current moment san jose 2022 the power of a resurrected savior is here now So that every single sinner 
can repent, believe, and be born again too, can be raised up with Christ too. And that means change, my beloved. That means, I'm talking about real change from the inside out. I'm not talking about behavior modification. I'm not talking about psychotherapy. I'm not talking about all those ridiculous self-help techniques. Do this and you'll be that much better. I'm talking about the internal transformation of the heart and mind. Right? When you're born again, you're giving a new heart, you're given a new mind, you're giving a new purpose and a new desire and a new purpose to end in Christ. Eternal life is a nice way to put it. Jesus said, anyone who hears my voice, who hears and believes the gospel of repentance and faith, he proclaims in verse 25, he says, will live. Anyone It doesn't matter what life you've lived. It doesn't matter how long you've rebelled against God. Any single person who hears the voice of Christ and the gospel of salvation by grace through faith and believes in Christ, Jesus says, you will live now and you will live for eternity. It's so reminiscent of God's words of hope to the people of Israel in the Old Testament. He said this through Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah 55, 3, God speaking to his people Israel at the time. He said, incline your ear and come to me. Hear that your soul may live. God loves life. God wants us to live. God wants no one to perish, including you. The one who hears and believes the gospel of Jesus Christ will live now and experience the resurrection power now. That's the already aspect of the kingdom that we can enjoy. We can really know it, and we can really walk in it. And he's able to say this, my beloved, Jesus, of all people, of all people, able to say this because he says, I have eternal life in me. Look at verse 26. Verse 26, for as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. That for, that little tiny word at the beginning of that sentence in verse 26 is really, really important. Jesus is saying, listen, I have resurrection power to give to you to make you alive right now because life is in me. Not just any life, but eternal life. Jesus says, I possess it. Now, certainly the Jews listening, they believed that in the Old Testament taught that God is life, right? They understood that, that, that God is life and that all life comes from God. Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 6 said it very clearly. You alone are the Lord, speaking of Yahweh, the God of the Bible. You have made the heavens with their host, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them. You give life to them all. In other words, we believe that God is self-existent and self-sufficient. He needs nothing from anyone ever. Otherwise, he couldn't be God, right? Whereas all living creatures, now listen to this, my beloved, including you, including human beings, derive their life, their sustenance, their ability to be here this morning from the living God. But here is a man, right? This is Jesus Christ in the flesh. This is the God man. And what is he saying? He has the audacity to say to these believing Jews, oh, by the way, I have that same life in me. No wonder they wanted to kill him. He's saying, I have the life, the eternal life of God in me. That's why we, at the very beginning of the Gospel of John, John chapter 1, verse 4, we hear what? That in him, in Jesus, was life, eternal life. You say, well, what's the big deal? Why are you, why are you hampering on this? Because not only did Christ say it, it means he can give it to others. The reason that he states it here, Jesus says, I have life, and that means I can give life to other people, to you, through repentance and faith. To whom exactly? Look at verse 24. To whoever hears my word and believes him, the Father who sent me, he has what? He has, he has, present tense, eternal life. So what Jesus was saying to the Jews and what he said to Martha when her brother Lazarus died and what he's saying to you through the word this morning, Jesus is saying, I am the resurrection life. I'm it. You want eternal life? You want to be raised right now? You want to overcome your sin now? Jesus says, it's me. I have that power. I have that life in me to give to you by grace through faith. Hear my voice and believe and be saved. Christ can say that. No one else can say that but Jesus. No wonder millions have gathered to worship him this day. So the first great implication of Jesus rising from the dead 2,000 years ago, the first great implication for us here in 2022 is that Christ offers you eternal life now. 
I, I don't care where you were up to this moment. At this very moment, he offers you eternal life. This resurrection Sunday. It's fine, thank you. No other event in human history has this kind of power. Not the armies of Rome, not the ability to have electricity, not the splitting of atoms comes close to this type of power. To take an image bearer, all mankind made in the image of God, fallen creatures, dead, right? We're dead in our sins. But this power, this person comes and says, listen, I can take you dead sinner and I can make you alive. And I can not only make you alive now, I can make you alive forever and ever. And this is what Christ offers to all who believe. To all who believe. You were, if you know Christ, you were once a perfectly, you see, I want to be perfect. You were perfectly dead in your sins. You know that? Put that on your resume. Hire me. Perfectly dead in my sins before I knew the Lord. That is a true statement. But being perfectly dead, you did not love God, you did not worship God, you did not desire the things of God. And then Christ comes along and says, listen, I'm going to give you freely this great gift of life, even though you've hated me and my Father all along. And he does it not because we're worthy of it, not because we've earned it, and certainly not because we've done enough good things in our life to merit God's presence. He gives it to us through his own death and resurrection. Jesus does by overcoming the power of sin and death in us. In fact, what what he's doing really on the cross, it's a power replacement. He takes away the power of death and sin that has control over you, and he replaces it with his own power, which is life. And that's why he can offer life to all who repent and believe. It is not only a power, it is infinitely greater than the power of sin and death. That's why Christ can guarantee you through repentance and faith that you will live forever and ever. That's quite, quite a promise. Quite a promise. It's one of the reasons I believe that so many Christians have gathered in so many churches to rejoice in this. Because this is true. That through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, sinful people like me and sinful people like you who were once completely dead can be made alive, can be resurrected spiritually right now. And that Christ grants us that by grace through faith, power to live now. When Jesus on that first Easter morn came to life, he, didn't, he wasn't raised like Lazarus was raised or Jairus' daughter. They, they, they suffered again and they died a second time. When Christ was raised, he was raised to eternal life. He was raised to the place where you're going to be if you're in Christ. Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul says that Jesus is the first fruits. And so that, that was a, a first century Mediterranean term to describe the first of something, right? The first of a harvest or a crop. And what it meant was that Jesus was the first fruit of a new creation, the first fruit of a new humanity. We often will call Jesus the second Adam. The first Adam brought all mankind into sin. The second Adam comes along, Jesus Christ says, I'm going to bring mankind out of sin and into eternal life. And he did. Through his death and through his resurrection, he has led millions up to this point. Millions of souls have repented and believed. He's led them into this new spiritual humanity, this new human life to enjoy now and to never die again. You see, he was raised and he was free of all temptation and sin completely. So too will your resurrection in Christ. He was raised being free from sickness and pain and death in this fallen world. Experiences we all know all too well. He was raised above that and offers that to you too. Free from all broken marriages, all bankruptcies, all failed dreams, all the covetousness, all the greed, all the hatred of fallen man. His resurrected life, which he gives freely to those who hear his voice, is a life that truly desires, listen, here's a profound statement, that truly desires to love God most. To know and love God most and walk in obedience in the newness of life. Romans chapter 6, verse 4, Paul said, We were buried therefore with him, with Christ, by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, listen, we too might walk in newness of life. Imagine that for a minute. You, today, walking in the newness of life. 
My beloved, ever since the fall in Genesis chapter 3, I would say that mankind throughout all of human history has been trying to walk in the newness of life. Finding ways to resurrect ourselves from the condition of sin and death that we find ourselves in, clearly in a broken world. So for example, when our, we find our governments failing, the answer, the political resurrection is what? We pass more laws and we elect more politicians. And yet, you would say today, the problem remains and maybe it's even getting worse. Political resurrection fails. Maybe, my beloved, maybe for you it's your broken body and you turn to diet and you turn to exercise and you turn to medication and, and it's an attempt to resurrect your youthfulness. Well, time's against you. If you don't know that, you will. Maybe it's an attempt to resurrect a broken dream. You had your heart set on something, you pursued it, and you didn't get it. So what do you do? You replace it with another passion or another dream, and you pursue that. The problem is it will never give lasting joy and will never give lasting peace. And if you're not old enough to know that, you will realize that too. Maybe it's your heart that's been broken by a friend, by a loved one, by the passing of someone. And so you try to resurrect your broken heart with another love. You say, I'm going to go back to school. I'm going I'm to pour myself into work. I'm going to pour myself into my possessions or entertainment or people. Whatever it is, my beloved, a heart that was made to be satisfied by God's love first and foremost will never, ever be satisfied by any other love. So you want to resurrect your heart that's broken? Find Christ. Know God. And that heart will be raised up with him. Friends, listen, it's not that fallen man doesn't know we need resurrecting. Everybody knows we need resurrecting. Certainly these last few years have testified to that. How broken we are as a people. How broken we are as a world in light of what we've seen during the COVID crisis. We have broken marriages. We have wayward children. Substance abuse has skyrocketed. Materialism, debt, collapsing economy. We all know we need the newness of life. A new way to live, but we don't know how to find it. And we look in all the wrong places to find it. The world offers us things like money, sexual freedom, nonstop entertainment. The world says pass more laws, get better schools, establish racial justice, establish economic equality, all the ways that they believe that we can be resurrected as a people. And what I found fascinating now, I'm, I'm in my mid-50s, so I can actually say this. This has been the program for decades. Billions and billions of dollars, lots of laws, mainstream media pouring into these ideas of how to resurrect. Where are we today? Are we better off? Are we better off than we were 10 years ago, 20 years ago? Most of us historically say, no, we're worse off. So these ideas of resurrection by the world do not work. They cannot work. They offer no real hope of real newness of life, of real resurrection spiritually. Only, listen, only Jesus can do that. Only Jesus has life in himself to offer sinners like us newness of life. Only Christ. Only Christ has that power and only Christ has that desire to make us new, to make a new people for himself so that we can what? actually live differently. So you don't have to be enslaved to your sin. And all the things you say, oh, I wish I could stop doing that. Christ says, you can in me repent and believe. We can have the newness of life by faith. It's such a simple and yet profound truth. Simply trusting in Christ as your Lord and Savior. He says, I will give you this eternal life now. Look at verse 25 again. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and now is here. It's now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. So the first point, I hope you see that the resurrection power is now. If you do not know Christ as Lord and Savior, then what a great day to repent and believe. What a great day to know the resurrection of Jesus Christ right now. What a great day to have the newness of life that you can live in obedience and love to the living God. Amen? That's worth one amen. All right, listen. <clears throat> That's the first resurrection or the resurrection that has come. But Jesus talks about another resurrection. He said there's something coming down the road. Point number two, I pray you're still with me, the resurrection to come. So he says there's a resurrection now offered to you now and there's a resurrection that is to come. But I want you to notice something from these following verses. And please don't run out those doors. He says everybody's resurrected at the end. 
Every single man, woman, and child in the end will be resurrected from the dead, regardless of what you believed here on earth. The difference is not all will be resurrected to eternal life. Everybody will be resurrected, but not all to eternal life. So through the life, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus becoming Lord of Lord and King of Kings, he not only, listen, he not only has the power and ability to give life, resurrection life to you right now through repentance and faith in him, he not only has that power, but he's also the judge of the heavens and the earth. And he will come again and he will judge. Look at verse 27. By the way, my beloved, I'm a messenger of the gospel of Jesus Christ. These are not my words. I do not believe that I would say these things to any gathering on any day in order to promote the well-being of a local church. If I wanted people to come, I wouldn't say these things. These are the truths from the word of of Christ himself. So I want you to listen with all your might. These are not my words. Verse 27. Jesus is speaking, and he, God the Father, has given him, God the Son, authority. That word means power or ultimate power to execute judgment. Why? Jesus says, because he, speaking himself, is the Son of Man. He is the Son of Man. So here Jesus claims a title that we hear, we read about, but the Jews knew exactly what he was talking about. He claims a title Son of man that was described in the Old Testament specifically by the prophet Daniel. And Daniel talked about this man that God would send that would have all power and all authority over the heavens and the earth and would come and would reign. Listen, Daniel chapter 7, speaking of Christ now, this is hundreds of years before Jesus. And to him the Son of man was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, listen, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. In other words, Christ is saying, listen, I am the Son of Man. I'm the one that Daniel was prophesying about. I am seated upon my throne, and my kingdom will never, ever go away. I'm the king, and the kingdom will last forever and ever and ever. Now the Jews, they heard this, and they couldn't stand what he was saying. They knew what he was saying, that he is the Son of Man as prophesied by Daniel, and they believed it to be a brazen statement, so Jesus clarifies. Look at verse 28. Jesus says, do not marvel at this. He said, don't don't be shocked by this teaching that I'm the resurrection and I'm the judge. He said, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice speaking of his own voice and come out. So he says, don't marvel. He rebukes them for the lack of faith. He said, "Don't, don't marvel at this simple teaching. It was prophesied two years ago. Uh, centuries before Christ. In fact, Daniel also said this in Daniel 12 too. He said, many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. So the Jews understood this. They believed this teaching that this final day was coming, that, that God would come and raise the living and the dead and everybody would stand before the throne of the Lord. Now the Jew though hearing this, the Jew thought, well, we know who this is. This is Jew and Gentile. Right on that great day when Christ returns and everybody's raised up, all the Jews who are children of Abraham, children of the promise, they they enter into eternal life and all the Gentiles who do not know Yahweh, who do not know the God of the Bible, they will enter into eternal judgment. That's what they're thinking. And Jesus says, you got it all wrong. You got it all wrong. Jesus is saying to them, not in content but in love, he said, it's not the Jew or the Gentile that will determine one state but faith in the Son of Man. Faith in the Son of Man. Faith in Christ who has the power to give life, to raise them to everlasting life. Look at the latter part of verse 28. Again, he said, an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice, speaking of his own voice, and come out. They will be resurrected from the tomb. Now, my beloved, I I cannot think of a more extraordinary moment in all of human history other than the cross itself. Every single person ever buried in a tomb, in a mausoleum, every ash that's ever been scattered or kept in an urn, on that day will hear Christ from Adam and Eve to the last child that's born, and they will rise physically. That's a, that's a thought. I mean, you, t- you talk about a movie. I don't even know how, how, would you, how would you even cast that, right? All humanity, come for the casting. 
The same voice that spoke all of creation into being. The same voice, the same word that sustains, listen, at this moment, every galaxy, every star, every planet, every molecule will cry out and summon the living and the dead before his throne. On that real day that is really coming. It will be a most remarkable event. It will be a most remarkable event. And this means, my beloved, I want you to listen with sober ears. You can reject Christ as Lord in this life. You can. You can go your whole life saying, I do not believe in God. I do not believe in God's Son. I reject the gospel. I reject salvation. You may, in this life, live as Lord of your own life. Little L, not capital L. Lord of your own life. Making up your own rules, cutting your own path, doing as you want to do. But you need to know this. In the end, the last chapter of human history, Christ will come again in glory. He will raise the living and the dead, and he will judge. This is what the Bible teaches clearly to us. He said on that final day, Paul made this clear in Philippians chapter 2. He said every knee will bow, you know this, every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Every single person ever born will bow their knee and confess this truth. And so just as the prophet centuries before Jesus arrived said, hey, he's going to come, he's going to live, he's going to die, and he's going to rise. Now Jesus is standing here, the Son of God, and he says, listen, I'm going to come again in all the glory of my Father, and I'm going to raise everyone, and I'm going to judge. So the question, my beloved, for you is not if he's going to come. He's going to come. Of course he's going to come. The question for you is how will you know him when he comes? How will you know him? Every knee and every tongue, every single person ever born will confess that he is the Christ. But will you know him as Lord and Savior or will you know know him as Lord and Judge? One of those two categories. There's no third option. There's no plan B. This final resurrection, two distinct groupings, two gatherings of people. Look at the latter part of verse 29. He describes them. We get an idea. Those who have done good, to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. So you have two groupings, two classifications of people. Those who have done good to eternal life and those who have done evil to eternal damnation to judgment. Now you read that as a cursory reading or out of context and you think, well, that sounds like a works-based salvation, Pastor. That's real simple. I do good according to my own standard, of course. I do good and I get in. I do bad, I don't get in. What's the problem with that? Well, that's contrary to the entire plan of redemption in the entire Bible, Old and New Testament. God does not say, work your way into my good graces. We enter his good graces by his grace and his grace alone. So, not only is it against the plan, look, just bump up against the 24. We've already read it, but see it again. We know that Jesus is not saying that because in verse 24, a few verses earlier, 5, he says, whoever hears my word and believes him who has sent me has eternal life. Right, so he's obviously not saying one salvation by works and one by faith. It's not whoever hears and does good works, it's whoever hears and believes. It's whoever trusts in God. Galatians chapter 2, verse 16, we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but what? Through faith in Jesus Christ. So what is he saying? Why does he say this? What does 29 mean if it's not work salvation for anybody who does good? He's saying this, listen that the good or evil deeds that you do reveal who you really are. That's what it's saying, right? By the the way you live your life reveals your heart, who you really are. Remember, the first resurrection is being born again. It's, It's being regenerated, right? So now you live in the newness of life. And if you've been born again by the power of the Holy Spirit, then you're going to live differently than you were when you were dead. That makes sense. Right? You've been made new. You have the power of the Holy Spirit. You put your faith in Christ, and now you live in the newness of life in God. And so, of course, you're going to see good works. You're going to see good fruit. Remain dead in your sins, and you will only see the same bad fruit that comes from that. It's an old heart or a new heart, a dead heart or a living heart. Jesus made this very clear in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 7. He said, every tree, this is simple. We don't have to be farmers. Listen. Every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. 
right? So if you go up to a tree and you see that all the apples are rotten, you're not going to eat from that tree. But if you look down the road and you see nice, juicy red apples, you're going to pick from that tree. He said it's the same for us. If our heart's been changed in Christ and we've entered the newness of life, your life will change. If not, then it will not. So the sobering truth is that on that final day, every single man, woman, and child will stand before Jesus Christ as either Savior or Judge. As either Savior or Judge. And them knowing Him, you knowing Him as Savior or Judge will be determined on your relationship with Him in this life. How do you know Him now? Do you know Him as Savior? If the answer is no, then you know Him as Judge. A life of true faith in this life will produce good works. And Jesus is saying that leads to the resurrection of life. That's eternal life with God the Father. All the treasures of heaven. You with God and his people forever and ever. Or a faithless life that results in evil works that leads to the resurrection of judgment. Eternal damnation. So one final resurrection, but two eternally distinct groupings. Saved and unsaved, eternal life and eternal judgment. Now, it's so amazing, my beloved. In order for Jesus to save one of us, just one person in all of human history, before he experienced the resurrection to eternal life, he had to, in his person, experience the resurrection of judgment. You know that. What makes Resurrection Sunday so endearing to us is knowing what Christ did to redeem sinners like us. He had to receive in himself the full judgment from God we rightly deserved. So although perfectly sinless, Jesus Christ, every word, thought, and action, his whole life was perfectly obedient in love to God. Even though he was perfectly sinless, he received on the cross the wrath of God that we justly deserved. And he did that in order to appease the wrath of God. He had his blood spilled and his body broken so that he could take our judgment and and give us what? Give us life, right? He took what we deserved and then gave us what he deserved. He deserved eternal life. He lived the perfect sinless life before God. And this is how a resurrection life comes to us today. It's how it comes to you if you know Christ. It's offered, listen, the gospel says you're saved by, by grace through faith. It's free. It's free to you. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to go and do a work or give any money or say a number of prayers. It's given to you freely. But it costs God everything to give it to you freely. Right? When we say the gospel is free, it doesn't mean it didn't cost anything. I know we say that. We use that word today a lot, especially in politics, right? Free education. Well, it's not free. Someone's paying for it, right? The gospel of grace is free, but Christ paid for it with his own life. So in order to grant spiritual life to you, the judge had to judge himself. The judge had to be judged and lose everything. You know that? Jesus Christ should have been the one who was most adored, most worshipped of all people who have ever lived. But he lost his reputation, his comfort. He lost his family and his friends. He lost his disciples. They abandoned him. He lost his city. He was put to death outside the city. He lost the nation of Israel. He lost his body. He lost his blood. But worst of all, he lost the Father. He experienced the eternal damnation, eternal separation from the Father for those three hours on that wretched cross. He subjected himself to the full judgment he knew was necessary in order to save a single sinner like you or me. In order for us to enjoy resurrection life right now and be guaranteed of being resurrected in the future, Christ had to go through all this. You talk about love, my beloved. No one has ever loved you like this. No one will ever love you like this. Even if you don't know Christ, he's saying, this is how much I adore you. This is what I did to have you. Right, the cross and the resurrection, it's a great love letter from God to sinful man, redeeming those who do not even want to be redeemed. He did this great sacrifice for you, Romans 4.25. He was delivered over to death for our sins, right, to pay the debt we owed and was raised to life for our justification to make us right with God. That's the work of the the cross and the resurrection. For those who refuse to honor the Son now, these are such hard teachings. It means judgment to come. 
If you take your last breath on this side of heaven, it doesn't mean you won't be resurrected. You'll be resurrected, but to be resurrected before the judge of the universe. The all-powerful, almighty, living God will judge you, and he will judge you fairly. He's a good God. He's a fair God, and he will open up the books, and your life will be laid out, and he said, well, I see so much rebellion against me. I see that I offered salvation to you multiple times, and you said no, no, no. And what you deserve is eternal damnation. And every single sinner in that moment will agree. There'll be no arguing in the court of God. There'll be no plea bargaining with God. There'll be no sentence reduction with God. God is perfectly just and must punish every sin perfectly. That's why it's called the great white throne judgment. The white represents the purity by which all mankind will stand before the living God. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. But some of those confessions will end in the resurrection of judgment. Eternal death. You know what that means? That, that means being cast out of the newness of life, right? I mean, God says, I'm going to come and I'm going to make all things new. New heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem, new people, new bodies, all the newness. <clears throat> Who doesn't like new? I mean, we want to be made new. We want to experience the newness. And Christ says, you can have that through me, but if you reject me on this side, if you enter into the eternity without knowing Christ as Lord and Savior, then there'll be no newness for you, only old only sin, only death. That's what you know now apart from Christ. And he says, that's what you will have for eternity. Cast in a lake of fire, subject to the torments of hell forever and ever and ever. Yeah, it's such a horrible thought. It's a horrible thought. The final day, it's binary. It's binary. Its outcome awaits us all. Eternal life, or eternal judgment. You can't change it. I know that we live in a time when we think we can change reality. You don't change reality. You can't change Christ coming. But you can change how you see him. You can change how you come before him. Your knee will bow and your tongue will confess. But it doesn't have to be as a rebel. It doesn't have to be someone who's still dead in their sins. It can be as a son or daughter it can be as a friend of Christ. It can be as someone who has been born again and made alive in this life, resurrected to newness of life now and forever and ever. It should cause every one of us, I know it's caused me this past week to stop with a very sober question. Do I know you, Lord? Do I know you? Do I really know you? Have I been united with you? When I come before you, will I, will I know Christ? I'm speaking to myself. Will I know him as judge or savior? We, we, we got to ask that question. I will not know him as savior because I simply said it with my mouth. I will not know him as savior because I have, I've gone to seminary, I preach sermons. I will know him as Savior if in the deepest recesses of my heart I have truly surrendered to him as Lord and Savior. That he is my God. You will know him if you know your heart's been changed. You know you know him if you've been born again. And you say, I know this newness of life. I've tasted this newness of life. I know the sin that I used to do, and I hate that sin now. And I still stumble at times, but I'm striving to be holy as God is holy. I know this newness. I've tasted it. It is good. It won't be by your good works. It won't be, my beloved, by a baptismal certificate or church membership. My heart breaks. I have so many friends who ramble through life, no purpose, no eternal meaning, no thought of what happens when we die. When you go to a funeral and you see the casket and you see someone being lowered into the ground, and unless Christ comes before that, you're going to experience that too. What happens next? I, I would say that's a very reasonable question to ask by every single living person. And yet we don't ask it. We act as though it's not going to happen. And if it does happen, when it happens, everything's just going to kind of work out. Somehow, we don't know how, but somehow. We dismiss God, we dismiss the resurrection. 
We dismiss the day of judgment. Some of us dismiss it in the name of science. We actually will hold on to the lie of evolution, having never proof text our own claims. Weak, by the way, theologically and scientifically. Many of us embrace false religion, and we think that I'm going to work my way into God's good grace. I'm going to resurrect myself. I, who am the problem, I'm going to resurrect myself from my own problem. Doesn't work. Many of us, listen, those of you who claim Christ, many of us are in the church, and we say, well, I was baptized. I made a profession of faith with my mouth. You, pastor, dunked me in those waters. Many of us will lean on a profession early or good works that we've done or good works that we're doing. We're no different than the Jews in Jesus' day when we do that. We will lean on those things, but we've never been born again, and therefore we will only see Christ as judge. The right response, I'm going to close. The right response to the resurrection of Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago is believing and living in light of that faith. That's it. He rose 2,000 years ago. In light of that truth, it's you believing, putting your life in him, and then following him. You say, what does that mean? Following Jesus means living as Jesus lives. It means knowing him. It means knowing him through his word. It means communing with him daily through prayer. It means loving others as he loves you. It means serving others as he serves you. It means walking what? In the newness of life. In the newness of life you have through his resurrection. Let me read to you from Matthew 25. Jesus is talking about this last day. He said, When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep on his right. Those are those who have put their faith and trust in Christ and he will put the goats on the left. Those are those who refuse to be saved. You have to refuse salvation. You know that. Especially after being here. Now you know. You have to refuse to be saved in order to enter eternal judgment. My friends, do not be deceived. Heaven and hell are real. Christ is coming, and it's not heaven for everyone. I know we want to think that. It's not true. It's not heaven for those who try to be good. Hear the voice of Jesus this Resurrection Sunday and believe. Put your trust in him. As a child trusts a parent, put your trust in him. And you know what will happen? You'll experience resurrection power right now in the newness of life and you are guaranteed that on that day when he comes again in glory, you're guaranteed to be resurrected into eternal life. That's you and your new body forever and ever before the throne of God, praising him, worshiping him, and enjoying him. Oh, that's where you want to be. That's where you want to be, my beloved. Revelation chapter 20, verse 6. Blessed and holy is the one who has a part in this first resurrection. You believing now over these, the second death has no power. But they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years in this life and in the life to come. Amen? Uh, Let's be those people. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that Jesus was, was straightforward with us, that he didn't pull any punches, Father. We're so thankful that he had life in himself to give freely to those who simply believe those who do not want to continue in this life enslaved to sin and rebellion and the foolishness, Lord, of bringing pain upon ourselves and those around us. He offers life to those who cannot see clearly, Father, that the end is coming and that Christ will judge and then apart from salvation by grace through faith in him, we will be condemned. I ask for two things this morning, Father. I want you to bless. I ask you to bless all those who have gathered here. If they know you, Father, as Lord and Savior, I pray they would rejoice this morning deeply. I pray they would rejoice in the power that's been given to them to overcome sin and walk in the newness of life. 
I pray that he would rejoice deeply in knowing that in a few short years, we will be with you in your presence. And when you come, Father, you will resurrect us to eternal life forever and ever, seated with you upon your throne. Give us that great hope as believers. And for those here, Father, who do not know you, show them, show yourself to them as the good and gracious Father that you are. Show them before it is too late. Show them Christ as the suffering servant who gave his life to redeem them. Show them the hope of salvation that comes through the gospel. And then by your spirit, Father, I pray you would make them alive this Resurrection Sunday. Oh, Father, bring a great harvest into your eternal home. Start here in this church if you are pleased. Raise everybody to life who still remains dead. I ask that you would do this, Father, for the blessing of those who have gathered, for our friends and family, and I ask it above all else for your glory that you, as the living God, might be glorified in those that you bring from death into eternal life. Do that for your sake, I pray. In Christ's name, amen.